My name is Terry Martin. I'm, I'm a senior anchor at DW News in Berlin, and it's my great pleasure to be hosting this session for the Bucharest Forum 2020, uh, involving our special guest, Mr. Mircea Joana, who is the Deputy Secretary General at NATO, a post he took up just one year ago uh, from Romania. He has served as president of the Romanian Senate, as Romania's ambassador to the United States, and as the country's minister of foreign affairs. So we're looking very much forward to talking with you. And I give the floor straight to you, Mr. Joana. Uh, thank you so much, Terry. And uh, I'm so, so very happy to be with you today. You know how much uh, the events and everything that the Aspen City Romania does is uh, close to my heart. And uh, also let me thank again uh, the German Marshall Fund, uh, the Bucharest Office for supporting this prestigious forum. Uh, and also I welcome a participation of so many great speakers, moderators uh, from all walks of life and also a very large number of European and global network uh, of Aspen Institutes. It's a little bit uh, counterintuitive because for the first time since uh, its inception in 2012, I am and we are not physically present for this ninth edition of the Bucharest Forum. But the fact that we are able to meet virtually underlines our ability to adapt in face of adversity, to be resilient. And this is the very topic I want to focus on today. Because we all need to be resilient and we need to be prepared for the post-pandemic economy and geopolitics, which appear to be leading the world into a new, more turbulent historical cycle. Or as the title of the forum aptly coins it, an acceleration of history. I listened just before coming into this discussion, how presidential advisor Dudu Ionescu mentioned on behalf of President Johannes, uh, the fact that uh, Romania's national defense strategy for 2020-2024 puts resilience uh, at the core of the principles of good strategic governance. The efforts to enhance the social resilience and critical infrastructure must be calibrated in order to generate the capacity to respond to new type of threats, which are amplified by current global intricacies and developments, including technological advancement. I also like to thank uh, to Prime Minister Orban, not only for uh, his uh, remarks at the beginning of the forum, but also because he understands like we all do, that resilience is also a whole of government angle. And also I would like to thank Romania here from NATO headquarters for uh, the concrete contributions to the broader allied efforts. Because Romania is indeed a vital NATO ally. Its commitment to our alliance is continuously demonstrated by the central part our country is playing in the overall deterrence and defense posture of the alliance. Its contribution to allied operations and missions as well as the truthful involvement in the debate about the future of the Alliance. You see the logo and NATO 2030 just behind me. Ladies and gentlemen, this year has been an extraordinary year of change. The coronavirus has had a deep impact on all of us. Most obviously, this is a health crisis, but it has proved to be much more than that. The global lockdown and the restrictions that we live with every day affects us politically, economically, socially and strategically. The economic impact of COVID-19 will be far greater than that of the financial crisis just over a decade ago, from which many of our nations and communities have only just recovered. It would be unfortunately felt most by the young and the have-nots in our societies. The full implications will not be known for many years, but they will be profound. It is fundamentally changing the way we work, where we work, and how we interact with each other. It is affecting the way our children go to school, how we socialize with our friends and families, and how we organize our lives. It is also shaping our security, even the idea of what security means. Traditionally, security issues discussed at conferences like this and dealt with uh, in the corridors of NATO have focused on military operations, troop movements, or preventing terrorist attacks. There is still much to discuss these kind of things, especially here in uh, the Black Sea region, where we see Russia continuing its attempts to establish a sphere of privileged influence with its military buildup, exercises like the recent Kafka's 2020, 
the frozen conflicts on the territory of close partners of NATO, like Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova. And also, this was highlighted by a recent study on Russia, NATO, and the Black Sea security, which was just published by this great organization. And of course, we see these very days, the ongoing conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh. Also, we see the protests of people's rights to choose in Belarus and political upheaval in Kyrgyzstan. But the nature, the very definition of security threats is changing. Today, competition between nations often becomes in more subtle forms. Disinformation campaigns, election interference, cyber attacks, foreign direct investment. This is the return of political warfare. Military and non-military threats overlap with each other, and they also compete for political attention and resources. We are also now more concerned than ever about the security implications of climate change. The NATO Secretary General, Jens Stoltenberg, just gave a speech on this subject only last month, in which he set out the very real security threats that emanate from our changing climate. Drought, floods, and other extremes of weather are making life increasingly difficult for people around the world, fueling conflict, exacerbating existing threats, adding pressure on natural resources like food, water, and power, and yes, driving migration. The fall in the price of oil we have seen this year, which looks set to continue, will have a dramatic impact on those nations that depend on the sale of oil and gas to fuel their economies, especially as more countries commit to achieving net zero emissions and moving away from fossil fuels towards re renewable forms of energy. How those countries will react remains to be seen, but there are also certainly risks in this realm too. These changes are compelling countries across the Alliance and around the world to reassess their defense and security strategies. They are reaching beyond the traditional defense matters to issues of the economy, health, climate, disruptive technologies, and critical infrastructure. And ensuring their nation's resilience is a top priority. Also, at the level of European Union, they engaged in a similar process. The strategic compass is a good example of the work done on the other side of the city. It is important that NATO and EU continue to work in an ever closer strategic partnership. And that the lessons learned from this crisis brings more convergence on our strategic culture. NATO too is looking to the future. Last December, NATO leaders asked Secretary General Stoltenberg to reflect on how to make our alliance even stronger, even more successful. So earlier this year, he launched a process called NATO 2030. It will help our alliance to be stronger politically, bringing more issues that affect our security to NATO's table, even if sometimes discussions are not easy. We should continue to be even stronger militarily so we have the capabilities to deter and to defend ourselves whenever necessary on land, at sea, in the air, in space or cyberspace. And we have to be more global in our approach. This doesn't mean a global presence of NATO, but NATO, of course, will remain a regional organization, but working ever closely with our partners around the world to defend our values and way of life is paramount for our continuous success. This is essential as we deal with an increasingly broad definition of security, with threats not only coming from the, any point of compass, but affecting the entire world at the same time, like we see today, COVID-19 or climate change. If we are to weather these storms and meet the challenges of the future, then the transatlantic relationship that has been the beating heart of NATO for over 70 years must deepen even further because the challenges we face are far greater than any single country can meet alone, no matter how strong. But the beauty and value of the NATO alliance is that no country is alone. Together, we make up half of the global economy. We are almost a billion people, and we are at the forefront of new technology. In fact, if there is a positive to be taken from the current crisis, is the acceleration in the adoption of new technologies, which benefit our security. NATO's challenge, and our opportunity as well, is to ensure we fully adopt and exploit these new technologies and gain the maximum benefit, while also planning and preparing for additional vulnerabilities they may bring. NATO's ability to innovate is what has guaranteed our military superiority, including our technological edge for the last seven decades. But NATO and the West 
may now be on the verge of a new Sputnik moment. A moment where a non-Western power, not sharing the same values as we do, might actually overtake us. So we must redouble our efforts and focus on investments even more on new cutting edge capabilities. We also have to ensure that NATO allies coordinate as they de develop the new technologies. Never before has the issue of interoperability been more important. A ship from one country can always sail next to a ship from another. But if they are unable to share information, if their radar and tracking systems cannot communicate, they may as well be in different oceans. Beyond our efforts within the Alliance, we also have to engage with those who are driving technological innovation in the private sector, with defense industry, with the big tech companies, and sure, with the small startups. Science and technology is increasingly becoming a formidable instrument of political power. Maintaining NATO's technological edge is key for the enduring success of our alliance. This also means making the most of the talents of all our people, including and especially here in Central and Southeastern Europe. We have so many talented people, young people, smart people, who cannot only help to transform our militaries, but also our societies. It is vital that we invest in them, train them, support them, and encourage them to stay in their home countries, and also to return to their home countries for the benefit of all of our people. But no matter how strong we are militarily, it alone is not enough. No matter what challenge you can think of, the first line of defense is a strong, resilient society, able to prevent, to endure, to adapt, and bounce back from whatever happens to it. So we need to place a far greater emphasis on resilience in the years to come. NATO allies have already agreed high standards for the resilience of our societies in areas including the continuity of government, secure transport and communications, including 5G, energy, food, and water supplies. And we are working closely with the EU on this because ultimately, although resilience is a national responsibility, it is also a collective effort. As part of NATO 2030, we want to see how we can strengthen these requirements. We will discuss this at the meeting of NATO Defense Minister later this month and look forward to agree further requirements at the next NATO summit in 2021. I very much welcome the study on national resilience presented by the Aspen Institute Romania for this, uh, for this forum. And I'm also especially pleased that the Aspen and GMF young professional from our networks will participate in the first ever NATO Youth Summit this November, where Secretary General Stoltenberg will be addressing the young generation of our community. So resilience is like a muscle. It needs to be trained and exercised to keep it strong. And NATO has been working these muscles for many, many years. Article 3 of the Washington Treaty, NATO's founding document, places a duty on all allies to work to make themselves more resilient. When the document was drafted, of course, they were concerned with an armed attack from the Soviet Union. But today we need to be resilient against a far broader range of threats. Resilience must be at the very core of our societies and of our security. But this thing, and the thing that is most important, that most sets a robust, resilient society, a robust citizenry, apart from one will crumble under pressures and things that are keeping us together, the glue of our alliance, the glue of the political West are our values. Because a society that is based on freedom, democracy, and the rule of law, where people are free to act and choose as they will, a just society where people trust the institutions and the people who govern them, that is a resilient society. We know this well in Romania and other countries of Central and Eastern Europe. After the fall of the communist system, the prospect of membership of NATO and the European Union helped transform our, our nations and societies. We strengthened our democratic institutions, improved respect for minority rights, established civilian control of our militaries, and resolved border and ethnic disputes peacefully through dialogue. All of this made our nations, our societies, immeasurably stronger and more resilient. Just as the absence of any of these things made the communist bloc so brittle that it collapsed almost overnight. We might constantly be on our guard for the erosion of our values, 
from without or from within. Freedom, democracy, human rights, the rule of law. Without these values, we place ourselves at risk. And we cannot allow that to happen. The challenges of our free societies in the political West face now are greater than any in living memory. This is why our values are so important, why our unity is so important, and why our NATO alliance is so important. Because when we stand together, work together, and protect each other, we are stronger and we are safer. Next year, the year Aspen Institute Romania will celebrate its 15th anniversary and the Bucharest Forum its 10th edition. We are counting, and I am counting, on all the Aspen Global Network to continue to spur transformational and value-based leadership, continue to stimulate an educated, argument-based debate on topical issues facing our societies, and continue to put the work of the unmistakable Aspen method, where the triple helix of public, private, and civil society sectors interact and build lasting and resilient solutions for the challenges of today and of tomorrow. I want to thank you again for inviting me and having me for this great conference. And Terry, sorry for being a little bit too long, but I wanted a little bit to give, if you want, our, our thoughts and our reflection on this very topical uh, conversation that you're starting today. Now I'm all yours, ready to engage in a conversation. And I understand taking questions is even more important than everything else. So I'm in your hands now, Terry. Deputy Secretary General, John, thank you very much for that. And I'm looking forward to having this conversation with you. And for everyone who is watching this online, I do want to encourage you to submit questions for the Deputy Secretary General. Uh, there are, I'm sure, a lot of questions floating around out there. I know I have a few uh, just listening to your remarks. I really appreciate your remarks, your emphasis on resilience within the NATO alliance, and also your emphasis on common values that hold it together. I will, I'll be asking you about those values and the relationship to unity in just a moment, as well as resilience. But I want to start by taking a step back and looking at your own career, uh, having just joined NATO as Deputy Secretary General uh, a year ago. And I wanted to ask you what you may have learned uh, during your first year at NATO uh, in this very, very high position uh, that you may not have been aware of regarding NATO in the past. What have you learned over the past year that, you, that has maybe surprised you about NATO? Oh, thank you. Uh, that's a tough one. <laughs> um, actually, it's, yeah, it's one year. Time, time goes by very fast. If I would be putting uh, this exceptionally dense, convoluted and turbulent year in perspective, I would say that myself and here at NATO, all of us, we should be always prepared for the unexpected. Be ready at any single moment, like we have been for 71 years successfully, to make sure that any kind of crisis, non-military crisis, would not transform into a security and military crisis. That's the fundamental thing that I've learned in this one year. That the world is, is, is really accelerating, um, that the transformation in geopolitics, geoeconomics, geotechnology, and in our societies, the conversation of our own democracies, the discontent of our young public and also many of our citizens on the way in which they are governed, the injustice in our societies, that all these things come together. And again, the business we are in in NATO, and this is why we are so successful, is to make sure that we don't allow an overlap of multiple crises and the conditions for a perfect storm are not met. And so for the time being, this year, NATO has responded wonderfully well at the pandemic. We show solidarity, we helped each other, not only within the Alliance, but also our partners and friends and neighbors. I was impressed to see uh, this surge of solidarity. And I would like to thank again our military, uh, our men and women in uniform that have been at the forefront together with our medical doctors, with the other professionals, uh, at the forefront of our common defense. So one year, which is, you know, so tense, so agitated, so, so full of surprises that 
also teaches me that NATO is ready to, to face any surprise, uh, hopefully less of these surprises in the future. But we are ready and we are agile and resilient. It has been a, a year full of surprises. Um, I, you, you know, we've had uh, Nagano Karabakh coming up just recently. Uh, Belarus, the tumultuous developments there, which are still ongoing. We've seen conflicts in the eastern Mediterranean involving uh, two NATO partners. This is still an issue that's being resolved. I know NATO is working very hard on trying to build a, uh, a facility to accommodate some sort of uh, reconciliation there. Um, those are all threats that NATO has to contend with to stop these things from getting out of control. Of course, COVID-19 as well. You bring to this job a very specific perspective because of your background in the Central and Eastern European region. You are the first person to become NATO Deputy Secretary General from any country that joined the alliance after the end of the Cold War. What does that tell us about NATO's relationship with the countries of Central and Eastern Europe? Let me just refer to to one of the recent uh, involvements of NATO and of our Secretary General in this uh, complicated political and strategic uh, uh, situation uh, to the east and to the south. The Secretary General Stoltenberg just visited uh, the previous days Ankara and Athens. NATO has brokered, if you want, between these two allies of ours a deconfliction mechanism in the Eastern Mediterranean. There was a moment when things were becoming uh, complex. I have to say that also the value of what we do in NATO, that we also are in coordination with the rest of the Allies. And we also appreciate very much the role of Chancellor Merkel uh, in, in ensuring a broader, uh, let's say, context, also from the European Union angle and the German EU Council presidency, just to making sure that we, we, we de-escalate and now things seem to be back on track. Coming back to, to my experience, I've dedicated my life, and I think that that's our generation in, in, in former uh, communist Europe, to basically bringing our countries back into the West. That was the mission, that was the dream, that was the, the endeavor that we all embraced it, it was for me and for my generation, not only people that have done politics or diplomacy like myself, but every single citizen, we were looking to this chance to catch up with the lost historical time. Because it's very difficult to explain to our Western friends and colleagues how it is to live your life in, in a communist country, in a closed society. And sometimes we bring this kind of, of vitality, this, this kind of, of desire to, to catch up and, and, and also make sure that we are, will not ever in our future history for our nations live those horrors again of war, of dictatorship, of authoritarian regimes, of people telling us how to think, when to eat, when to have heat in our homes, like there's a case in Romania, never, never again. So I think my, my position here is a reflection of the fact that our countries have matured that we gained influence, that we also start to learn the game, how it is played, because that's a sophisticated, complex uh, operation. And this is an encouragement for myself, my countrymen and countrywomen, and also friends from all over this great region of ours. To be even more ambitious, leave aside any provincial complex. Uh, we have come to an age, and I think our obligation is to make sure that Europe and the transatlantic bond remain strong, this is part of our deep desire. This is also part of our philosophy of life. And as we sense that the moments that we are facing today and the years to come will be even more tumultuous, even more, uh, with more trepidation, I think uh, our part of Europe will bring that indispensable uh, ingredient of vigilance, of resilience, in a deep sense of belonging together after such a long separation from our natural family, like the communist years. NATO 
has expanded massively since the Cold War. It now has 30 members. Uh, it's a very diverse grouping, and it has become so diverse and so large over a relatively short period of time. I want to ask you how the, the Alliance is coping with the strain of that expanded size and diversity. We're doing okay, look at me. I'm doing okay. <laughs> and um, uh, of course, of course, um, uh, growing in number, growing in uh, diversity of geographies, of uh, strategic cultures, of historical experiences, uh, in level of economic development, in level of capacity of governance, also in, 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 in also in terms of culture, in a way, because this four or five decades of communists really changed somehow uh, the psyche, the, 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 you know, the, the way in which we think and we relate to, to life with good and bad things. Uh, because sometimes us in Central Eastern Europe, we cherish uh, uh, belonging to the political West probably even more than the ones who take this for granted. They've never lived a different experience. So that's a plus uh, and a minus. But I would say that we are exceptionally successful at working at 30. I see this every day. Even difficult topics, even difficult political conversations are, are dealt with uh, in a sense of uh, coherence, of, uh, of respect of each other's positions. We also have seen uh, the militaries uh, in the new uh, NATO allies transforming in a spectacular way. Um, and, and also uh, some of them developing cutting edge capabilities and also being present in so many NATO missions and operations. If there is one thing that I mentioned in my speech uh, that is uh, to be kept in mind as we move into this massive technological transformation of our societies, including of military warfare, and the way in which technologies are impacting on our lives, we have to make sure that interoperability between the allies that have massive scientific, technological, venture capital markets, deeper, broader, also, we have to make sure that all the allies, irrespective of their size and the economic uh, power, uh, are basically able to do things together, to, to fight together, to prepare together, to train together. This is something that we do. I'm also chairing the innovation board in NATO and together with all my colleagues all around the Alliance, we're doing this. And I'm also seeing something that we know, uh, especially in Central Eastern Europe, the huge uh, human talent that is, is, is abundant over here. So probably in terms of uh, exact sciences, in math, in physics, in biology, in chemistry, in IT, all these things. Um, also because communism uh, was distorting so much uh, the liberal sciences, everything was Marxist or some form of dubious ideological uh, addition to that. But you cannot have communist mathematics or socialist physics, they're exact sciences. And in a way, this is probably one of the most important contributions that the new allies bring to the Alliance, a wealth of highly educated people. And as uh, we are catching up also with the, uh, with the ladder of competitiveness, I'm convinced that NATO will continue to be stronger 30, almost 1 billion people. Uh, that's a very, very uh, remarkable, respectable, and influential community uh, of nations. And this is why I believe that NATO will continue to, th to, 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 to be one of the most successful alliances in history, also because of the contribution of the newcomers. We have a couple of questions coming in. I want to encourage uh, more people to ask questions. Uh, I'll start picking up on those in just a, a short moment. But uh, just one more question from me first. You mentioned that NATO is an alliance of countries of shared values. You mentioned specifically human rights, democracy, the rule of law. But NATO is also a collection of countries with shared interests. Uh, the primary binding interest, of course, being to preserve the security to assure the defense of the of the countries which includes a, a shared a clause of mutual defense the art famous article 5 clause that uh, says if one country is attacked others come to the defense 
I just want to ask you again about the sense of unity within NATO with respect to those shared values. Uh, do, you, do you see a sufficient unity within NATO at, with 30 members on the question of shared values, also in Eastern Europe? Or is this, uh, is this an issue that, is, that you are having to address within NATO yourself? As I mentioned, um, um, NATO is a is a unique organization uh, because there's no other organization that is putting uh, uh, as its fundamental mission to preserve the security and the peace of our citizens. And that's why Article 5 is so sacrosanct. Um, but it's not only Article 5 which is important in the Washington Treaty. Uh, Article 3 on resilience, um, Article, the top one, on values. So we should read the Washington Treaty as a whole. It's a masterpiece of legal work. And the fact that it's so enduring uh, over time is a, is, a, is, a, is a testament to the brilliance of our founding fathers. But not always things are perfect in, in NATO. And, and I think it would be a mistake for us to try to project uh, an image uh, of uh, an alliance that is so homogeneous and so smooth in everything. No, because you mentioned we have Nations within the alliance have also specific strategic national interests. They have specific geographies. They are facing specific challenges. Our allies to the south, of course, they are more concerned about the risk of migration, about the risk of terrorism, all these things that are emanating from a very unstable Middle East and also from a growing competition, geopolit geopolitical competition uh, over Africa. Allies to the east. Romania included, also our Baltic friends, our Polish friends, everybody on the eastern flank. Of course, they are concerned, as all of, all of us, but more concerned because of geography and historical memory about the aggressive stance of Russia. We also see new challenges coming from many other directions, from space. We have declared NATO in London uh, when our leaders last met uh, last December. We declared space as an operational domain. We have declared cyber as an operational domain. So my point here is that when it comes to things that are about life uh, or death, when it's about peace or war, when there is something so profound, allied nations always have the resources, the political resources, the interest to come together to a common position and be able to continue to be strong in military terms, strong politically, and also to, to play this, this global role. So NATO is, an in, in a way, unique. Also because, to, to tell the whole story, because it's the only organization that brings North America and Europe together. And this, this indispensable transatlantic bond is something that we have to cherish and preserve and strengthen and deepen, because no country alone, no Europe, nor America alone, are strong enough today and big enough today, also economically, uh, and in, that, in time, probably also militarily, to cope with formidable rivals uh, and challenges uh, that are competing not only for global supremacy, but also for the commanding heights of the way in which societies are organized. And as a, as a guy coming from, from, uh, from my part of, of, of Europe and having lived under communists half of my life, I do not want to see a proposition again that autocratic nations uh, are basically uh, imposing their rule uh, on all of us. So that's why NATO is so important. It's unique. We have to continue to invest in it. We have to continue to cherish it. We have to continue to speak about it. We have to continue to, to, to engage with the younger audiences, not only preach to the choir, um, uh, also because uh, also strategic communication uh, is so important for us. And I think we are doing a very good job in that direction too. You mentioned interoper interoperability early on uh, within NATO. You uh, also talked about unity and NATO's relations with Russia. Well, those three elements come together in the case of Turkey, one of one of NATO's most important and largest partners, and. Turkey being in a part of the world that is currently in turmoil, right next to Syria, uh, also in its relations with Europe and migration uh, at 
uh, an issue there. We've got a question from a Mr. Laurel Lazar asking, saying, you mentioned interoperability. interoperability. How is Turkey's acquisition of the Russian S-400 Triumph systems uh, going to impact NATO policies? Uh, how, how is NATO dealing with this issue of one of its biggest partners buying into a Russian uh, military equipment ecosystem? No. Turkey is obviously a very important ally uh, with a geography and geopolitical uh, positioning that is, uh, is very, very important as uh, all the other allies in uh, in the southern uh, southern eastern part of, of the alliance are equally important like greece like the other allies uh, in, in in that part of this very very complicated uh, conundrum um, of situations having said that uh, when uh, secretary general stoltenberg visited ankara just the other day he raised the issues of the s400 systems uh, to the top leaders in, in, in Turkey, expressing the concern we have in NATO and also other allies have the same concern about the risk of integrating uh, a system that into a NATO system and thus making our capabilities and our uh, deterrence, uh, you know, be eventually jeopardized. Of course, there's a national sovereign decision. It's not up to NATO to tell uh, to, to, to our ally nations uh, what to do and what not to do in, 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 in practical terms. But I think the concern we have about this one has ex been expressed very clearly by Secretary General, has been done repeatedly. And of course, we hope that as the ongoing conversation uh, also with our US allies uh, and also with our, with our Turkish allies, that the solution uh, could be found in order to avoid, uh, you know, complications uh, for the missile system uh, and defenses that also Turkey is relying upon from, from NATO. So uh, sometimes there are sensitive issues that do appear. We're not trying to, 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 to hide them or to run away from those. That's, that's uh, an issue that is still uh, very much uh, on the forefront of our attention. We have another question. Uh, unfortunately, we not, can't tell you who it's from. Uh, this is from an un unidentified <clears throat> uh, watcher of this, but someone who has contributed what I think is an interesting question and particularly relevant for you, given your experience uh, in, in Romania. The question is, what do you think about relations between the Republic of Moldova and NATO? Uh, what is the most effective way to give clear direction based on democracy and European integration? in post-Soviet countries in general? That's the question. I'll just leave it at that, uncommented on my part, and let you mull that over. You can maybe help our, our viewers understand just where Moldova is in relation to, to uh, the European Union and to NATO. Listen, the Republic of Moldova is a partner of NATO. We have uh, around 40 partnerships all around the world, from the Asia Pacific, of course, uh, around the Black Sea region, very, very deep enhanced opportunity partnerships with Ukraine and Georgia. We have a vibrant partnership with the Republic of Moldova. So NATO is very clear. Number one, we respect uh, the Republic of Moldova's uh, decisions in terms of their strategic alignments. They have a stipulation in their constitution about not being part of military alliances. We respect that. Having said that, over the last 20 years, we've been assisting the Republic of Moldova in building stronger institutions, bringing more professionalism to their armed forces. We are now developing a program of, bring, of bringing good governance and transparency uh, and, and, uh, and the, a Western way to conduct the business of government in many things. So as much as the Republic of Moldova wants from NATO, we are ready to, to provide with the kind of support that we provide to, to, to many of our, of our other partners. When it comes to the European aspirations of the Republic of Moldova, uh, I have to mention that the Republic of Moldova is one of the three countries where NATO and the EU are working jointly uh, on how to basically Combine, if you want, the toolboxes of the two organizations. The EU is a far bigger magnet. Uh, and we have seen also the transformations uh, in the 
foreign trade to the Republic of Moldova since the European Union has granted the Rep Republic of Moldova in Ukraine and Georgia the status uh, of uh, uh, being associated also in terms of the, of the single market. So I personally believe and hope that the Republic of Moldova and the citizens of the Republic of Moldova, irrespective of their ethnic background, to understand that Europe and the European dream is far more attractive and is far more conducive for growth, for fulfilled lives, for democracy or rule of law and freedom than authoritarian uh, counter propositions coming from the East. It's up to the Republic of Moldova and its citizen and its leaders to, to, to decide which way to go. But if I will say as a Romanian and also caring so much about the Republic of Moldova is for historical and, 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 and political reasons, I think there is no, no match between the, the magnetic attraction of the political West and the counter proposition that uh, might be offered by, by others. And I think, like in Belarus, that we should allow these nations to choose in, in, in a sovereign way, in a free way, the direction they want to go. And these things about spheres of influence, we are very much against this concept that there are spheres of influence and the nation, just because of the curse of geography, is basically blocked or barred from choosing its own destiny. This is very much against the very DNA of the Alliance and the European Union. You mentioned Belarus. Uh, this is obviously an, an important current issue for NATO right now, not, not only because Belarus is on NATO's borders, it's on the periphery of NATO. It affects uh, NATO countries neighboring it, particularly Lithuania being very much in, involved and in, uh, affected by it at this point. But I wanted to ask you regarding Belarus, what do you, what has NATO done to assure that the claims by the current Belarusian president Lukashenko that NATO is building up its forces and is threatening Belarus, how have you approached that issue to, to de-escalate and assure that that, which I understand to be disinformation, uh, is, has not gained traction? Oh, it's huge disinformation and it's, uh, you know, if you want the manual of, um, uh, of leaders in a difficult situation uh, coming from a communist past to, to cry wolf and saying that the, uh, you know, the West, uh, NATO in this case, are uh, fomenting and planning for things. No, NATO is doing absolutely nothing. Everything we do is purely uh, defensive. Ah, we have a presence uh, in uh, in the Baltic countries, uh, in Poland, uh, which is, uh, uh, you know, uh, a reaction and a consequence of the Russian illegal occupation of Crimea and the illegal war in eastern Ukraine. That's a totally different ballgame. So we flatly reject this disinformation that's totally fake news. It's a sort of a desperation uh, in, into this. We have absolutely no plans. We are just you know, planning in a very defensive way. And it's just in a way, uh, you know, uh, uh, we are taking uh, this these statements from uh, Mr. Lukashenko as the statements of someone who tries to, uh, to, 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 to find imaginary adversaries in a very difficult situation. And by the way, I'm also happy to, to, to seeing the list of speakers at the Bucharest Forum to see also one of the most prominent leaders of the Belarusian opposition be present at the Bucharest Forum. And I think, uh, give them, giving, uh, giving the Belarusian people uh, the chance to choose their leadership and, the, uh, and their destinies is something that we all should encourage, irrespective of, uh, of where we sit and which organization we represent. Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, whom you may have been referring to there, who many believe won the Belarusian election and who is now in exile and leading an effort to try to bring about a peaceful transition of power within Belarus. And indeed, uh, she is talking about also trying to dispel the notion of spheres of influence in the region between the West, uh, in quotation marks, and, and Russia, or the US and Russia, if you will, uh, back into a bipolar situation. 
Yet, Russia does continue to play an extremely important role uh, on on NATO's periphery. Uh, the narrative that we heard from Lukashenko about NATO forces building up on uh, on the border to, to Belarus and posing a threat is something we're hearing from other sources as well, including you know, in coming out of Russia disinformation. This is a common narrative. How do you break out of this spheres of influence narrative? What is NATO's public relations, strategic communication strategy on that? You know, uh, we are open societies and that's why uh, uh, having freedom uh, of our citizens, of their thoughts, uh, also sometimes we are more vulnerable than closed societies to disinformation and manipulation. Um, this is something we have to cope with, and that's why uh, fighting this information, NATO and the EU, also NATO and the EU and the G7, we are working very closely together just to make sure that the fact that we are open society is not, you know, abused and used by our, of our, uh, some of the nations and non-state actors against, you know, the, uh, the very essence of our democratic societies. It's not always easy to communicate in closed systems because they shut down the internet uh, when something is not going well. They create their own internets just to make sure that, you know, professional journalists and then free flow of opinions are not reaching to the populations. But I would also argue that it's impossible to stop people from thinking, people from uh, aspiring uh, to, to, to more freedom, to more prosperity, and also to a fulfilled life. So this is why the spheres of influence is such an antiquated, uh, you know, concept looking from a NATO and EU perspective. Because in the end, and in the end, uh, irrespective of how much controlled democracy, authoritarian techniques, big brother techniques, surveillance of your own citizens, trying to stifle uh, opposition, who'd have thought only a few months ago that we'll see hundreds of thousands of youngsters and people in Belarus taking the streets to fight for democracy, not for joining the West per se, but just fighting for the fundamental right to choose your leaders. This is why I, I, I'm, I'm absolutely convinced. This is also part of my deep conviction, not only as a NATO, uh, you know, uh, high ranking official, but also as a human being, as a, as a citizen of, of, of my country, Romania, and also of the political West, that if we are resilient now, that if we really also upgrade our democratic systems, that we also look into the, our economic systems, and if we continue to evolve, open societies are always more conducive for prosperity, for talent, for innovation, for success. And that's why I believe that uh, this, this competition, which is raging right now, between democratic systems and closed uh, authoritarian systems, we will prevail just because human beings thrive in open societies and they tend, you know, to do to be the opposite in, in closed societies. So I'm a I'm a strong, strong believer in our capacity to to to, to continue to, to pursue that. And also for the neighbors of, of, of NATO to the east, to the south, not everybody will be in the position to join the alliance per se. There, there are also political uh, issues. That's why for NATO, the open door policy that worked wonderfully well uh, for many of our countries is something that is, is there. We just received recently our 30th uh, ally. So I think uh, NATO and European Union, uh, US, Canada, and all of Europe, democratic Europe, we continue to be a very, very, very attractive proposition to, to, to many of the nations around us. This is very interesting. It, it, we're approaching the end of our, our session. Unfortunately, we're, we're almost out of time. But uh, one more question in terms of how people think about, uh, about democracy or open systems versus closed systems. This is, uh, this is also a challenge for education. Uh, one, one of our viewers is, is asking, he's pointing out, this person is pointing out that uh, access to education and employment uh, adds to stability and security as well in the long term. The question is, what is NATO 2030's perspective on building resilience uh, through education and involving the younger generations in decision-making processes? I was wondering if you could 
reflect on that? No, thank you for the question. That's a, that's a very profound question because in the end, as I mentioned before, sometimes we tend to take the situation as it is for granted. No, especially the young generations in, in no matter the historical time, but especially now with this fantastic hyper acceleration of history, they are far more critical uh, of the status quo. They're questioning these things and they're right to question. And they're right to, to, to ask tough questions. And they're right to pressure uh, the political leaders and governments and institutions to deliver better, faster, and also to provide answers to their concerns. Also, of course, the older generations that are now so, so vulnerable also to this pandemic, they also have rightful similar questions. So what I'm just saying, with, that's my deep conviction, that if democracy and free markets are to continue to be the dominant proposition to the world, we have to continue to rejuvenate this. We have to continue to be critical against ourselves and make sure that the legitimate concerns of our public opinions are taken into, into consideration. This is also why NATO, Secretary General Stoltenberg on November 9th, it's opening the first youth summit that we, we've been doing ever. This is why our communication strategy and also our policies are going to much younger audiences. We are not going exclusively to, to, to the platforms and uh, think tanks and uh, corners of the, our national governments that are doing only traditional national security. We are broadening the scope and the, uh, and the, the conversation has to, to continue. Education is paramount into this. I think also the stress on our not only health systems, but also on education systems that the pandemic has put on our universities, on our elementary schools, on our kindergartens, on the way in which parents and children and grandparents and grandkids do interact in these very difficult moments will be one of the most important things. Future of work, skills, robotics, uh, artificial intelligence, big data, these are transformative things. And again, as a true believer in democracy and, and open societies and rule of law and good governance and transparency, I believe that, like always, our democratic system is work in progress. We should not rely on, and sleep on our laurels. We've been very successful for many, many decades and centuries. We have a form formidable competition uh, facing us as we speak. And I think we have to get our best energies, our best intentions and our brightest people to the forefront. And the young ones are like always our hope and the future of this great organization of ours. Mircea Joana, Deputy Secretary General of NATO, thank you very much for talking with us today. That was extremely insightful. I've gained a lot from it myself, and I think we've given the people who are following us online a, a lot to think about as well. I'd like to thank everyone for, uh, for contributing and for following us today. I want to thank the Aspen Institute Romania and the German Marshall Fund of the United States, of course, for putting together this Bucharest Forum 2020 and also this specific session with the Deputy Secretary General of NATO, Mircea Joana, thank you. Good luck with the forum. I'll be watching every single session if I can. <laughs> thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you to all who, who are watching and uh, take care.